We worship spirits. We worship Lucifer, the Lucifer and all his angels. They're just as beautiful as they did before they were cast out of heaven. He says there was a misunderstanding in the whole thing. He says among the inhabitants of the galaxies. And he says our master was misunderstood. Calma aí, mano. Vamos chocar o bicho, cara. We are at the dawn of a new age, the age of Aquarius. The past 20 or 30 years, there's been a big boom in meditation of all varieties in the West. There's no limitation in space when you go into thought consciousness. So that's where the, the meditative state is so key. When you transcend, you go beyond thought. You just experience pure consciousness. Consciousness is all possibility. It is all potential. Most people have experienced other dimensions and what have you, uh, either in meditation or near-death experiences or just spontaneously. And it's sort of an awakening that happens in consciousness. There's not going to be a second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is you. It's all of us. It is the awakening of the Christ principle in humanity. With this information comes the potential for what is called apotheosis. Human becomes God. And they have a variety of practices, very distinct practices, which are engineered to awaken your psychic center. Welcome, 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 welcome to the Best Damn Podcast. I am your host, John Keane. As always, I would like to thank you guys for joining me. As that you please add, follow, and check us out, www.thebestdampodcast.tv. Follow me, Instagram and Facebook, Best Damn Podcast, Twitter, The Real Best Damn, and wherever you're watching from, make sure to hit that like, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, let me know what you think, and share this link. Help me to get it out there, that way new people can find us. Also, make sure to subscribe and click the bell to get all the notifications. Um, and you can check out our tarot and astrology videos as well. Uh, this video is backed by popular demand. Um, just recently, I've seen so many comments of people saying, John, I miss your longer videos. John, I miss your old stuff. Uh, so we're going to start bringing back, you know, some of the uh, older style videos that we did before. You know, these deep dives, you know, kind of crazy research into the occult, conspiracy, um, really anything. And tonight will be no different. This is actually going to be a, a pretty big treat. So I hope you guys are excited. Uh, do make sure to join the Best Damn Fam. 33 bucks a month. Get access to our private, live, exclusive content, merch, so much more. Join us on Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. Or uh, keep in mind, we're completely viewer powered. That means we're fully funded and supported by you. So if you enjoy the content, you enjoy the show, you know, donate, support the channel. That's what helps me keep it going. Uh, or book your own personal tarot reading, 513-393-2396, or email the real best damn podcast at gmail.com. Tonight, we're going to ask the question, you know, uh, the New Age versus Luciferianism. Do we have a mass awakening into, you know, advanced consciousness or conscious awareness? Within the masses, is this, you know, uh, a spiritual movement, a spiritual awakening, a mass spiritual movement of awakening? Or are we seeing the masses be indoctrinated into Luciferian beliefs and principles, right? Through Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry. Um, we even see this seeping into politics, you know, with socialism and Marxism and it has many, many roots in the occult, as well as Scientology and, you know, many other schools of thought. So tonight we ask that question, 
you know, are we experiencing a mass awakening, a mass conscious awakening, a global movement, spiritual movement, or are we witnessing mass indoctrination into Luciferianism? So, you know, kind of the first thing is first is we're going to look at, you know, what is Luciferianism? Where does it come from? Where did it all start? Uh, very obviously, it's, you know, the serpent, right? It all starts in the, the, the Bible, the Garden of Eden, you know, Satan, Lucifer, you know, being the deceiver, deceiving mankind from the very beginning by offering fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And these are the mysteries. These are serpent knowledge, hidden truth, right? And serpent knowledge leads to a whole lot of things. So serpents in the Bible, um, which are referred to in both the Hebrew Bible as well as the New Testament, the symbol of a serpent or a snake played important roles in the religious traditions and cultural life of ancient Greece, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Canaan. And Canaan, in case you don't know, right, the Mesopotamians, um, Sumerians, this is, you know, the Anunnaki, Enki, Enlil, uh, ancient Greece makes us think of Hermes, right, Egypt, Toth, um, and, you know, these all really connect to luciferian you know mythos the serpent the symbol of evil power and chaos from the underworld as well as a symbol of fertility life healing and rebirth and we're going to look at all the different celestial meanings as far as like mercury and venus and pluto and all of that you know it's fair and the sun worship the cube worship and how all of that fits into this now nehas or hebrew for snake is also associated with divination right we know that divination derives from you know when we look at metaphysics the sacred sciences that's tarot that's astrology including the verb from the meaning to practice divination or fortune telling now nahas occurs in the torah to identify the serpent in the garden of eden throughout the hebrew bible is also used in conjunction with seraph as in seraphim to describe vicious serpents in the wilderness. And remember, you know, the archons and Gnostic texts and beliefs uh, are made of the smokeless fire, right? Seraph, seraphic being that's a serpent or a fire being in the wilderness. The Tenon, a dragon monster, also occurs throughout the Hebrew Bible. And remember, dragon, dracos, uh, means a fabulous kind of serpent in Hebrew. In the book of Exodus, the staves of Moses and Aaron are turned into serpents. And the dragon several times to identify Satan or the devil. Or the book of Revelation makes use of ancient serpent and the dragon several times to identify Satan or the devil. Revelations 12, 9, 22. And the serpent is most often identified with the hubristic Satan and sometimes with Lilith. Now the narrative of the Garden of Eden and the fall of humankind constitute a mythological tradition shared by all the Abrahamic religions with the presentation more or less symbolic of Judeo-Christian morals and religious beliefs, now which had an overwhelming impact on human sexuality, gender roles, sex differences both in the Western and Islamic civilization, and the mainstream, the Nicene Christianity, the doctrine of the fall is closely related to that of original sin and ancestral sin. Unlike Christianity, the other major Abrahamic religions, Judaism and Islam, do not have a concept of the original sin, instead have developed varying other interpretations of the Eden narrative. And, you know, um, this is kind of, you know, where it all comes from, you know, is back with the serpent and Lucifer, you know, Hillel being the most beautiful angel. And we're going to show the different beliefs here. We start with Lucifer first and Venus. Lucifer, which is one of various figures in folklore associated with the planet Venus. The entity's name was subsequently absorbed into Christianity as a name for the devil. Modern scholarship generally translates the term in the relevant Bible passage, Isaiah 14, 12, where the Greek Septuagint reads as a morning star or a shining one, or rather than as a proper noun, Lucifer is found in the Latin Vulgate. As a name for the devil in Christian theology, the more common meaning in English, Lucifer, is the rendering of the Hebrew word Hillel 
in Isaiah given to the King James Version of the Bible. The translators of this version took the word from the Latin Vulgate, which translated by the Latin word Lucifer, meaning the morning star, the planet Venus, or light bringing, the light bearer. As a name for the, the planet in its morning aspect, Lucifer or light bringer. Um, and, you know, this is goes back to, to Rome, Egypt, right? And we also have uh, some versions considered the son of Aurora, right? Or the dawn, son of the dawn. And we hear these references in the Bible, right? The, the dawn or the goddess of dawn is Aurora. Or similar name used by the Roman poet, Catalus, for the planet in its evening aspect or Noctifer, or Nightbringer, and we know that Aleister Crowley, when we look at the study of the Lima and the OTO, which we're going to dive into all of this tonight, we're going to go through everything, you know, when it comes to the New Age and Lucifer, we're going to look at all the New Age concepts and beliefs, we're going to look at, you know, the different aspects of Luciferianism, secret societies, occultism, all of it, but Noctifer being Nox, or Pan, the night god, right, the night aspect, or dark aspect of Lucifer. Um, and, you know, and this kind of brings us to uh, the apotheosis, right? Um, apotheosis being like human taking on divinity. You guys will hear in many, many videos, right? Spiritual videos, they'll say, Namaste. The divinity in me recognizes the divinity within you, right? This, this divine nature that's within all of mankind. Right, being like God, apotheosis this is where you also hear a lot of um, concepts of, you know, antichrist or messiahs or things of that nature. Now, before we get to the apotheosis, we look over at Venus. And Venus, which is the second planet from the sun, sometimes called the Earth's sister or twin planet, as it is almost as large or has a similar composition. And remember, like a twin or a nemesis, a dark twin, uh, you know, always a, a tale of two brothers, you know, in creation, you know, um, one representing masculine, you know, red, feminine, blue, solar, lunar, you know, light, dark, male, female, good and evil. Uh, an interior planet to the Earth, Venus, which is like Mercury, appears in the Earth's sky never far from the sun, either as a morning star or an evening star, and that's where you get the dual concept. Aside from the sun and moon, Venus is the brightest natural object in the Earth's sky and capable of casting visible shadows on the Earth at dark conditions and being visible to the naked eye in broad daylight. Venus is the second largest terrestrial object of the solar system. Um, but having only an induced magnetosphere, the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Venus is the densest of the four terrestrial planets, and it looks like it's on fire, basically, like glowing, right? And there are many schools of thought, like Emmanuel Velikovsky, that believes Venus was once in the orbit of Jupiter, which is the king planet, or, you know, what we consider Io or Inky, right? Um, and it was thrown out of orbit, and many schools of thought as well that believe, you know, that Venus being a comet-like planet has actually had, you know, catastrophes with the Earth. You know, you could also look at it as Prometheus, many other, you know, names for uh, this planet here. Now, thinking of you know, Lucifer as being the most beautiful angel, right? He was both a cherubim and a seraphim and an archangel as well, right? Who seen himself as equal with God, causing him to fall and become Satan or Hasatan, right? The accuser, which is the equivalent to, you know, Saturn, uh, the Saturnian death cult, which is also sun worship, star worship as well, the Saturn sun, right? The sixth god, the black cube, uh, and we see this all over the world, right? So um, it's really interesting to think that all the religions believe they're so different, right? They all believe they're so different. But in my opinion, they are all worshiping the planets and, you know, the, the deities that we see in the Greek and, and Roman and Norse and all these mythologies and mythos, the same ones, which are the planets, right? Which would be the watchers the messengers, the archons, the governors, or the rulers of this reality making up the demiurge, uh, like the Gnostics um, also believed. Which, looking at Christianity, 
and we're going to look at this from all points of view. And after we get the, the base, you know, definitions down, we're going to jump into some deeper, you know, crazier stuff. Christianity and Abrahamic monotheistic religion based on the life and teachings of Jesus and Nazareth, right? And it's the world's largest religion with roughly 2.38 billion followers representing one third of the global population. So whenever you hear about Christians being persecuted, like, you know, you make up one third of the world. Now, Christianity remains culturally diverse. Its doctrines concerning justification and the nature of salvation, ecclesiology, ordination, and Christology, the creeds of various Christian denominations generally, generally hold in common Jesus as the Son of God. The Logos incarnated, who ministered, suffered, and died on a cross, but rose from the dead for the salvation of mankind and referred to as the gospel, meaning the good news. Describing Jesus' life and teachings are the four canonical gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and with the Old Testament as a gospel-respected background. Okay. And it began as a second temple Judaic sect. In the first century, Hellenistic Judaism in the Roman province of G Judea. Now, the Hellenistic is huge, right? Because when we ever think of Helen, right, that's Hillel, Hell, Lucifer, right? Helen in the Hellenistic Judaism in the Roman province of Judea, right? And Roman Catholic Catholicism and what we see, um, all of that truly connected to, right? It's um, all of these pagan ideas kind of, uh, you know, and, and, and rituals and rites um, and masses brought into, you know, what we call modern Christianity. And it's an external, exoteric story about something that is occult and mystical and esoteric that permeates every religion in the world, you know, whether you believe so or not, right? And... Jesus' apostles and their followers spread uh, around the Levant, Europe, Anatolia, Mesopotamia, and the South Caucasus, Egypt, and Ethiopia, despite significant initial persecution. It soon attracted Gentile God-fearers, which led to a departure from Jewish customs in the fall of Jerusalem, AD 70, which ended the temple-based Judaism. Christianity slowly separated from Judaism. Emperor Constantine the Great decriminalized Christianity in the Roman Empire by the Edict of Milan in 313, right? 33 in numerology, right? Later convening the Council of Nicaea in 325, which would be um, 37 or 37777, uh, where early Christianity was consolidated and will become the state of the Church of the Roman Empire in 380, which is uh, 13. Right, three as well. The early history of Christianity's United Church before major schisms is sometimes referred to as the Great Church. Okay, moving forward here. A great church. And finally, the devil in Christianity is the personification of evil. He's who rebelled against God and in an attempt to become equal to God himself. And this would be Lucifer. He's depicted as a fallen angel who was expelled from heaven uh, at the beginning of time before God created the material world. And is in constant opposition to God. The devil is identified with several figures in the Bible, including the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We've talked about the serpent story, right? The the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some people believe that's sex, but you know, the knowledge of the good and evil it, to me is what's hermetically sealed, what's occulted and hidden, right? It's the the serpent knowledge, right? Um, and before God created the mirror, the devil is identified with several figures, the serpent, the Garden of Eden, Lucifer, Satan, the tempter of the Gospels, Leviathan, the dragon, and, the, and uh, in the book of Revelation, which will show you that really quick, where they're talking about mystery religion and mystery Babylon. Early scholars discussed the role of the devil, scholars influenced by Neoplatonic cosmology like Origen and Pseudo-Dionysus portrayed the devil as representing deficiency and emptiness, the entity most remote from the divine. 
According to Augustine of Hippo, the realm of the devil is not nothingness, but an inferior realm standing in opposition to God. The standard medieval depiction of the devil goes back to Gregory the Great. He integrated the devil as the first creation of God into the Christian angelic hierarchy as the highest of the angels, either a cherub or a seraph, who fell far into the depths of hell and became the leader of the demons. And Cherub is one of the unearthly beings who direct, directly attend to God. The numerous depictions of Cherubim assigns them to many different roles, protecting the entrance of the Garden of Eden. And the Seraph is a type of celestial or heavenly being originating in Judaism. The term plays a subsequent role in Christianity and Islam, and it's a fire being, right, the feathered being. Um, since the early Reformation, the devil was imagined as increasingly powerful, with not only a lack of goodness, but also a conscious will against God, his word, and his creation. So he is in opposition with Jesus Christ. Simultaneously, some reformers interpreted the devil as a mere metaphor for humans' inclination to sin and so downgraded the importance. But the importance played no significant role for most scholars in the modern era. It became important again um, in contemporary Christianity. So, moving forward here. And in contemporary Christianity, you know, what we have now, Pope Francis and the Abraham family house in Abu Dhabi, right? Which is a cultural landmark in the United Arab Emirates, which is where the um, Abraham Accord or the Middle Eastern Peace Treaty, right? The promise of peace and security, uh, which includes a synagogue, a church, and a mosque. And it's meant to be a beacon of understanding and peaceful coexistence and the document on human fraternity. How about that, right? This is crazy as fuck. Um, human fraternity, right? And the bringing of all the religions together. And this is that one world religion. You know, a Jesuit pope and Pope Francis too, right? Very crazy to see that we're moving towards that. And that's what many people believe is happening now is this mass indoctrination into Rosicrucianism, Hermeticism, um, which is really just the New Age spiritual conscious movement, right? Um, and this is Luciferianism, this mass indoctrination to bring about a one world religion for the new world order, right? This, you know, Illuminati new world order. It all derives from the arcane teachings, though. This is where it kind of begins when we look at the mystery schools and the secret societies. And we're going to look at some of the more prominent people, prominent minds of that, and where this all came from, too, because it may not come from where you think it did, you know? We know um, Blavatsky, you know, got her stuff channeled from uh, Dwaj Kool or DK, right, a Tibetan. A lot of their the mysteries came from Tibet, as well as Egypt, Crowley at the Great Pyramids, okay? So, um, let's take a, you know, a, a quick look here and see exactly you know what this is the masters of the ancient wisdom and this is you know theosophy right masters of the ancient wisdom are claimed to be enlightened beings originally identified by the theosophist helena blavatsky henry s olcott and alfred piercy senate and others these theosophists claim to have met some of the masters during their lifetimes in different parts of the world Sometimes they are referred to by the Theosophist as elder brothers of the human race, adepts, Mahatmas, or simply as the Masters. Helena Blavatsky was the first person to introduce the concept of the Masters to the West. At first she talked about them privately, but she stated that after a few years, two of these adepts, Kathumi, K.H., and Moria, M., agreed to maintain a correspondence with Two British theosophists, Alfred P. Sinnott and A.L. Hume. The communication took place from 1880 to 1885, and during those years, the reputed existence and objectives of the Mahatmas became public. The original letters are currently kept in the British Library in London and have been published as the Mahatma Letters, which we have the Mahatma Letters. For those that are interested, we're going to be looking at that as well. The skeptical view, K. Paul Johnson, Masters Revealed, um, Blavatsky in the myth of the Great White Brotherhood, that the masters that Blavatsky claimed she had personally met are idealizations of certain people she had met during her lifetime. Hmm. So, you know, 
it is what it is, right? And these ascended master teachings, we're going to actually take a look at here. Um, this is Alice Bailey and Jiwaj Ku. This is the doctrine of the coming one, Western teaching, and the doctrine of the avatars, Eastern teaching. And this falls into what we were talking about earlier. Let's go ahead and pull this up here. The apotheosis, or apotheosis, right here. Right, apotheosis, ancient Greek. This is the divinization or deification uh, or making divine. This is the glorification of a subject, a person, to divine levels, and commonly the treatment of a human being or any other living thing, an abstract idea, the likeness, or a deity. And the term has meanings in theology which refer to a belief, art, or a genre. In theology, apotheosis refers to the idea that the individual has been raised to godlike stature. Right? Godlike stature. So, you know, Christ is an example of apotheosis. Jesus Christ. Um, the New Age movement, right? Many people. This is what Lucifer, the apotheosis, right? Believing he was a messiah, right? Anointed and godlike. So, many people through New Age beliefs now, the mysteries believe they can reach that, that place as well, right? And like I said, looking at the masters of the ageless wisdom, seen Blavatsky, but what about Dual Ku or DK, which was Master DK or simply DK, is believed by some theosophists and others to be a Tibetan disciple in the ageless wisdom esoteric tradition. So, looking at all the different ones, Crowley, Blavatsky. Um, Alice Bailey, right, all the, Manly P. Hall, all these minds, right, it, a lot of it came from channel messages we still see channeling in the spiritual community, right, and we're going to get to Kundalini and chakras and all that as well and, and show you how this all ties into it too, everything that you're being fed on great awakening, mass awakening, spiritual evolution, consciousness, all of it comes through this vein and it derives from these arcane truths, ancient mysteries, and wisdom, which is serpent knowledge, which is in the mystery schools, the occult, the esoteric, right, which is fundamentally the truth of every religion of the world as well, you know, so is it a mass awakening or mass indoctrination that it's, it's still in, on you, you know, and it's Luciferian, you know, at heart. The ageless wisdom, the esoteric tradition, the text describe him as a member of a spiritual hierarchy or brotherhood of Mahatmas, one of the masters of the ancient wisdom, defined as the spiritual guides of mankind and teachers of ancient cosmological, metaphysical, and esoteric principles that form the origin of all the world's great philosophies, mythologies, and spiritual traditions. According to the Theosophical Writings, Diwal Q is said to work on furthering the spiritual evolution of our planet through the teachings offered in the 24 books by Alice Bailey of Esoteric Teachings published by the Lucis Trust, which Lucis is lucky, right? Then named the Lucifer Publishing Company. He is said to have telepathically transmitted the teachings to Bailey and thus regarded by her followers as the communications director of the Masters of the Ancient Wisdom. And let's see what this Master of Ancient Wisdom had to say. This is Alice Bailey in Jiwal Ku, The Reappearance of Christ, or The Return of Christ, Chapter 1, The Doctrine of the Coming One, Western Teaching, The Doctrine of Avatars, Eastern Teaching. Whenever there is a withering of the law, and an uprising of lawlessness on all sides, then I manifest myself. For the salvation of the righteousness and the destruction of such as do evil, for the firm establishing of the law, I come to birth age after age. And that's the Bhagavad Gita, Book 4, Sutra 7, 8. Now write down the ages in many world cycles, in many countries, and today and all great points of tension have occurred which have been characterized by a hopeful sense of expectancy. Someone is expected and his coming is anticipated. 
Always in the past, it has been the religious teachers of the period who have fostered and proclaimed this expectancy, and the time has always been one of chaos and difficulty. Of a climaxing point at the close of a civilization or culture, or when the resources of the old religions have seemed inadequate to meet men's difficulties or to solve their problems. The coming of the avatar, the advent of a coming one, and, in terms of today, the reappearance of the Christ are the keynotes of the prevalent expectancy. And think about that, too. Even in Christianity, what are people waiting on? They're waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. The Christos, Christ meaning anointing, Messiah, Messianic Jews. Right? Like this is, everybody seems to be waiting on the same thing, but they're calling it by different names, right? You got the left-hand path calling it Lucifer and the right side calling it Christ. Uh, but in essence... Like I said, is this new age evolution of consciousness or mass indoctrination? You know, like I said, it's up to you on what you believe that is. But someone is expected and his coming is anticipated. Always in the past, it's been religious teachers of the period who fostered and proclaimed this expectancy. And this time has been one of chaos and difficulty of a climaxing point at the close of a civilization or culture and when the resources of the old religions have seemed inadequate to meet men's difficulties or to solve their problems. The coming of the avatar, the advent of a coming one, and in terms of today, the reappearance of the Christ are the keynotes of the prevalent expectancy. When the times are ripe, the invocation of the masses is strident enough and the faith of those who know is keen enough. Then always he has come, and today will be no exception to this ancient rule or to this universal law. For decades, the reappearance of the Christ, the Avatar, has been anticipated by the faithful in both hemispheres, not only by the Christian faithful, but by those who look for Maitreya and for the Bodhisattva, and as well who expect the Imam Mahdi. When men feel they have exhausted all their own resources and have come to an end of their own innate possibilities and that the problems and conditions confronting them are beyond their solving or handling, they are apt to look for a divine intermediary and for the mediator who will plead their cause with God and bring about a rescue. They look for a savior. This doctrine of mediators or messiahs of Christ and of avatars can be found running like a golden thread throughout all the world faiths and scriptures and relating these world scriptures to some central source of emanation they are found in rich abundance everywhere. Even the human soul is regarded as an intermediary between man and God. Christ is believed by countless millions to act as the divine mediator between humanity and divinity. The whole system of spiritual revelation is based and always has been based on the doctrine of interdependence, of a planned and arranged conscious linking and of the transmission of energy from one aspect of divine manifestation to another, from God in the secret place of the Most High, to the humblest human being, living and struggling and sorrowing on earth. Everywhere this transmission is to be found. I am come that they may have life, says the Christ, and the scriptures of the word are full of the intervention of some being, originating from some source higher than the strictly human. Always the appropriate mechanism is found through which divinity can reach and communicate with humanity and it is with this communication and these instruments of divine energy that the doctrine of avatars or of divine coming ones has to do. An avatar is one who has a peculiar capacity besides a self-initiated task and preordained destiny to transmit energy or divine power. This is necessarily a deep mystery and was demonstrated in a peculiar manner and in relation to cosmic energy by the Christ who, for the first time in planetary history as far as we know, transmitted the divine energy of love directly to our planet and in most definite sense to humanity. Always to these avatars or divine messengers 
are linked with the concept of some subjective spiritual order of hierarchy of spiritual lives who are concerned with the developing welfare of humanity. All we really know is that down the ages, great and divine representatives of God embody divine purpose and affect the entire world in such a manner that their names and their influence are known and felt thousands of years after they no longer walk among men again and again. They have come and have left and changed world and some new world religions behind them. We know also that a prophecy and faith have ever held out to mankind the promise of their coming again amongst us in an hour of need. These statements are always statements of fact, historically proven. Beyond this, we know relatively few details. Now, the word avatar in Sanskrit means literally coming down from far away. Ava, as a prefix to words and verbal nouns, expresses the idea of off, away, or down, right? Like coming down, falling, or coming down from heaven. Avatarum, comparative, farther away. The root av seems at all times to denote the idea of protection from above and is used in compounds and words referring to protections by kings or rulers and in regards to gods. And you know what? That's, um, you know, something that I think no matter if we look at, you know, Mithraism, right, the ancient Greeks, the Norse, and Ragnarok, and the Bible, and every religion, a coming Messiah, a return of God, a judgment day, right? This is something that's seen over and over and over and throughout every religion, whether you're looking at Hermes Trismegistus, you're looking at Toth, the Atlantean priest king, Jesus Christ, Dionysus, I... Osiris, right? Like there's always a character, you know, that is the son of God or God, right? That uh, son God um, that acts as a savior of humanity, you know, uh, dies for our sins, essentially, you know. And I guess in the mysteries, essentially, you know, they're not just talking about this perfected being, like they're, you know, the, the rise of this perfected being um, on our way to Godhood that will lead the world, but the ability through the process of self-initiation and illumination of you yourself to tap into that divinity and that Godhood, that it is a birthright, right, to all of us, you know, to all of us. Now, out of the secret doctrine, we see from stanza four, and this is talking about the sons of the fire, right? These are the sons of God. Listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of the fire. Learn, there is neither first nor last, for all is one number, issued from one number. These terms, sons of the fire, or sons of the fire mist, and the like, require explanation. They are connected with a great primordial and universal mystery, and it is not easy to make it clear. There is a passage in the Bhagavad Gita wherein Krishna, speaking symbolically and esoterically, says, I will state the times or conditions at which devotees departing from this life do so never to return or be reborn or to return to incarnate again. The fire, the flame, the day, the bright, lucky fortnight, the six months of the northern solstice, departing, dying in these, those who know the Brahmin yogis go to the Brahmin. Smoke, night, the dark, unlucky fortnight, the six months of the southern solstice, dying in these, the devotee goes to the lunar night, or mansion, the astral light, the, or mansion, the astralite also in returns is reborn. And think about this, the sun of the dawn, sun of the morning, right? The Knox God, night God, um, you know, morning star. We, we see this, you know, recurring theme once again, right? And it's always connected to this return or whatever, right? Of a, a Messiah-like uh, figure or a perfect-like figure, the apotheosis or man tapping into that too, you know, becoming one star or the other, right? Um or reborn these two paths bright and dark are said to be eternal in this world or great kalpa age by the one a man goes never to come back by the other he returns now these names fire flame day the bright fortnight etc 
as smoke, night, and so on, leading only to the end of the lunar path, are incomprehensible without a knowledge of esotericism. They are all names of various deities which preside over the cosmos psychic powers. We often speak of the hierarchy of flames, of the sons of fire, etc. Sanka Charaya, the greatest of the esoteric masters of India, says that fire means a deity which presides over time, Kala. The ability translator, the able translator of Bhagavad Gita, Kashinath Trimbak Talang, MA of Bombay, confesses he has no clear notion of the meaning of these verses. It seems quite clear on the contrary to him who knows the occult doctrine. With these verses, the mystic sense of the solar and lunar symbols are connected. The Petris are lunar deities and our ancestors because they are created the physical man, right? This is the concept of the fallen, right? The sons of God coming unto the daughters of men, right? The masculine watchers, governors, primordial forces of the, the planets that are actually close within Earth that make up the rainbow, right? The seven colors of the rainbow, the seven days of the week, right? the, the seven, the sons of Satan, right? Um, Seven being the number of God, these are the watchers, these are the planets, these are the fallen, okay? Um, and, you know, these are the rays, the seven rays as well. Um, these the sons of fire or light, because they are rays of light, which also correlate to um, colors, shapes, frequencies, numbers, planets as well, days of the week, like I said, words, and they're all for deities. Every deity kind of comes back to one or the other, which is like the Saturn, Jupiter, God, Satan archetype, right? And we know that all of the archetypes um, derive from the zodiacal wheel, right? The 12 zodiacal archetypes are the, the 12 uh, disciples of Christ. Right, and that the story of Christ is also an astro theological story about the solstice, right, and the rising three days later, and that's why it's in every single tale that we see. Right, and people like Carl Jung have actually explained the reason we see the mythos play out over and over and over, and that we see it into our heavens goes back to Genesis. We were created in the image, right? In the image which means a phantom of projection and illusion and that you know this world of sound and light is a energetic or frequency um, you know mirror essentially like we're consciousness experiencing itself here seeing the reflection into this world of our, our thoughts right um, which are electricity which you know and it's this quantum multiverse in which you know we live in and that the outer space is the outer psyche, right? And that's what consciousness is without uh, us existing within it, right? Like, and this takes us to so many different things, like so many different rabbit holes, right? Um, and whether or not the earth is flat, hollow, a toroidal field, like, I mean, do we live in a holographic simulation? All of this, right? Uh, but in looking in the metaphysics, the esoteric, the occult, you know, the all being mind, Right, and these seven sacred sciences and these principles like of the Kabbalion, right, it all taps into the same thing, which takes us into metaphysics, astrology, um, and giving people the ability of divination to divine the future, right? The practice of tarot and you know, uh, using of intuition by tapping into higher consciousness, which believes that, you know, we in fact, you know, could be those sons of fire, you know. Um, that those those planets, those lights, those stars that are projecting or looking down their frequency onto us, and that's what we're receiving. Um, you know, maybe that's us, you know, and this is the projection, the illusion, the mirror down here as we're experiencing it, you know. Many different schools of thought when it comes to that. So, <laughs> many different schools of thought. Now, we got one more book we're going to look at here. We're going to dive into some videos and, and everything. I've got such a good uh, show for you guys. Um, this is the Arbitel of Magic, all right? And looking more at the arcane, right? Ancient mysteries, ancient wisdom. And then we're going to get into some letters from Albert Pike, the father of Freemasonry, and show you, you know, kind of how, you know, which Freemasonry was used to infiltrate Christianity throughout the United States, which has infiltrated the entire world. 
You know, and this takes us to right, Revelation 17, Babylon, the prostitute on the beast. And it says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, and this is seven, right? Seven angels, seven bowls, seven sons, right? Seven sisters, um, Pleiades. Um, which we can go back to, you know, uh, Cygnus and, you know, Orion and the Dogon and all of this. It all comes from the stars. Um, and that's why the Bible warns against worshiping the stars. But it says, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. And prostitute meaning feminine, divine feminine, the whore of Babylon, right? Uh, the Babylonian mysteries, mystery religion with the kings of the earth who committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth, who were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries, turning water into wine, right? Um, you know, being intoxicated, you know, with the, the, the magic, you know, of the mysteries. Uh, then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman who, and think about that, the seven heads, I believe these are the planets, you know, um, very well could be. And the blasphemous names, you know, are the title, the Venus, Mercury, right? Like these are uh, gods, deities, demigods, little g-gods, angels, fallen, watchers, messengers, okay? The ten horns represent the ten monoliths, right, of the Babylonian system on the face of the earth. Washington, D.C., Paris, France, right, so on and so forth, right? Um, and they're all according that phallic symbolism goes back to Egypt and those mysteries, right? And they all, you know, with the story of Osiris, Isis and Osiris, or the Anunnaki and um, Anu, and before that losing his member, his member being bit off, or Osiris having his cut off, right? Um, that's why we see these monoliths. These are the horns, you know, the ten horns, and there's ten of them on the earth as well, right? Now, the woman dressed in purple and scarlet was holding with glittering gold, precious stones and pearl, and the black and gold. We see that as part of the cube, cubala, cube father, right? Cube god, Saturn, Satan, okay? Uh, remember the sons of Satan. Saturn would be kind of like the all-father or the dark father masculine, um, you know, ruler of this soul system, okay? And the sun being the, the light, right? The sun of God, or sun of the morning, being Venus, right? Or Jupiter, right? Um, she held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery in the third eye, third eye awakening, kundalini awakening. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people. Right? And this is because, you know, this is the elect, those who are um, coming into the mysteries, right? They're uh, learning that and having this awakening. Okay? They're drunk with the blood from sacrifice, right? Um, the blood of the holy people who bore testimony to Jesus, right? The persecution of Christians, I saw her, I was greatly astonished. The angel said to me, why are you astonished? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which she has a seven heads and ten horns. The beast you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life and from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will, will come. And the abyss, Abaddon, Apollyon, right? The destroyer, right? Um, the destroyer of God, uh, Old Testament, right? Me, Nemesis, a dark twin. That could be Venus as well. Just saying, right? It could also be Saturn, right? Which um, Saturn, the dragon, the serpent, right? Remember, a serpent or fabulous kind of serpent is a dragon. Okay, this calls for a mind with wisdom, seven heads or seven hills on which the woman sits. This could also be the seven continents of the, the earth, as well as the seven planets, seven days of the week. There are also seven kings, okay? And kings is the, the, the priesthood and kingship of old Egypt, and all that comes from the Sumerians and the Anunnaki and all of that, right? Um, which would be the fallen or the watchers or the, the ETs, okay? 
uh, the fallen angels. These are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not as an eighth king, he belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw in the king are those who have not yet received a kingdom, but will for one hour, who receive authority as a king with the beast, they have one purpose, and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them, because he is Lord of lords, king of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Okay, so, you know, um... The name of names, Lord of Lord, that's Jesus Christ, right? That's the, the belief of Christianity, right? Those who follow Jesus, you know, the chosen, the elect, the remnant, right? And just kind of looking at, you know, kind of like the Gnostic point of view, this is the Ophites, right? The Ophites, from Greek word Ophis, or serpent. Uh, members of several Gnostic sects, that have flourished in the Roman Empire during the 2nd century and AD for several centuries thereafter. These are the Gnostic sects such as the uh, Nascenes, right? Nascenes and Canaanites. So Nicene and Canaan, Canaanites, right? And this takes us, you know, whenever we think of the Canaanites, I'm going to show you what, you know, included under the designation Ophites, these sects believe different in various ways, but the center of them all was a dualistic theology, good and evil, right, that opposed a purely spiritual supreme being, the accuser, the adversary, Satan, right, the one who opposed God, who was both the origin of the cosmic process and the highest good to a chaotic and evil material world. To the Ophites, man's dilemma results from his being a mixture of these conflicting spiritual and material elements. Only Gnosis... The esoteric knowledge of good and evil can redeem man from the bonds of matter and make him aware of the unknown God, who is the true source of all being. The Ophites regarded the Jehovah and Jehovah, that's Jove given, which is Jupiter, of the Old Testament as merely a demiurge, and Jupiter being the king planet, king of kings, uh, Christ who bore our stripes, Jupiter the striped planet as well, Jupiter being Ea, Inki, the lord of the earth as well, right? Um, or subordinate deity, who I, and that would also, you know, go to Thor, um, you know, many, many other gods, okay? Um, who created the Zeus. They attached a special importance to the serpent in the biblical books of Genesis because he had enabled man to obtain the all-important knowledge of good and evil that Jehovah had withheld from them. And think about that. You know, um, and the, the darker brother the, is Saturn, right? Enlil. You know, the Lord Commander Enlil. Or, you know, uh, one who destroyed the earth and the, the flood. And these are the two serpents or the two gods, right? In the Garden of Eden. You know, Enlil being the one who says, you know, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Inky being the one who brings the knowledge, saying, surely, you know, you, you won't die. You'll be like God. You know, and this is Lucifer as well, being like God, accuser of man, right? Like you see Satan, Lucifer, how they both play a role, masculine and feminine, Inky and Leo, right? And it goes through every religion in some way, shape, or form, and they always connect back to the planets, right? Which are um, the, the heavenly host. You know, these are the angels, the watchers, the celestial beings, right? The sons of God, okay? And those who came unto the daughters of men, the Holy Spirit of man, the divine feminine man, you know, which is our creative, intuitive, it's a, the right brain, the right side, which is, you know. Um, accordingly, the serpent was a true liberator of mankind since he first taught men to rebel against Jehovah and seek knowledge of the true unknown God. The Ophites further regarded the Christ as a purely spiritual being who through his union with the man Jesus taught the saving Gnosis. And you see here, you know, both go back to the Christ. You know, whether you think the serpent in the Bible is evil or you think the serpent brings knowledge, you know. And Canaan, or the Canaanites, serves as the ethic catch-all term covering various indigenous populations and the nomadic pastoral groups. These are nomads, right? And a lot of these mystery religions. Um, this is Levant or Canaan, by the most frequently used ethnic term. The book of Joshua includes the Canaanites as a list of nations to exterminate. 
The scripture elsewhere portrays him in a group as which the Israelites had annihilated. And I'm going to show you why. Canaan, this is Minerva, the owl, right? The sixth god, all of that. Let me make sure you guys have sound and go to a video real quick. And this is, you know, the, the societies that, you know, we see, um, you know, the, those who run the world, the hidden hand. For behold, here is Bohemian shrine, and holy are the pillars of this house. Weaving spiders come not here. This is the cremation of care. Hail, Bohemians, with the ripple of waters, song of birds, such music as inspires the sinking soul, do we invite you to midsummer's joy. The sky above is blue, the soul with stars, the forest floor is heaped with fragrant drift. The evening's cool kiss is yours. Campfires glow. The birth of rosy fingers gone. Shake off your sorrows with the city's dust. The birth of rosy fingered dawn, right? The rose, the cross, Rosicrucianism, the sun of the dawn, the sun of the morning, Lucifer. They're casting off their cares. This is a cremation of care where they burn the effigy of a child, right? Child sacrifice. This is Baal worship, right? Um, Baal, Baal, um, you know, the, the bull, the bull god, right? This takes you all the way back to the child sacrifice and shit like that that we see, you know, with the Mayans and um, Quetzalcoatl and Tetzicalapoca, which are the sun of light and darkness. Once again, Inky Emil, Sumerians, um, Jupiter, Saturn, you know, like I said, this is over and over and over, and it always goes back to these same, these same deities, these same planets, these same concepts, these two brothers here. The winds and the cares of life. But memory bring back the well loved names of gallant friends who knew and loved this girl. Hmm. Dear boon companions of the long ago, I let them join us in this rhythm. Not a place to be empty in our business. Let them join this ritual, my place empty. And see, and that is um, Walter Cronkite, I believe, that's doing the um, audio for the cremation of care that was filmed by Alex Jones years ago. You guys remember that, right? That's where all the presidents and, you know, uh, right here, Elon Musk. You know, we see uh, the AI system, you know, um, messenger rna 5g all of it right now right this is you know let me see here it's also forced all people great and small and rich and poor free and slave receive a mark on the right hand or their forehead so they could not buy sell let's say add the mark which is the name of the beast or number of his name you know in mystery babylon the mark of the beast you see elon musk here for halloween wearing his little baphomet you know he owns twitter it's part of you know Upside down cross and the forehead of Baphomet crest. Open acknowledgement of Satanism, I guess. You know, I don't know about that Halloween costume, but you know those who run the world or you know those who many people believe. You know, um, looking at more of this too. Let's kind of go a little deeper here. And I'm going to show you like the perspective too of. Um, what you know, Christianity believes is happening to our world, and a lot of people believe it's happening. You know, this the whole concept of the the new world order and uh, the persecution of those who follow Jesus, right? Those who follow Christ. Take a look. Uh. 
The satanic world order has infected the minds of millions of people, taken over governments around the world. Christians are now being held hostage by satanic forces, and everyone can see it. But this is a ripple effect of what's really happening. Demonic forces have invaded and taken over billions of people worldwide, body snatched by demons coursing through their blood. These people are nothing but avatars for demonic forces, but it gets worse. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that these forces come from quote, heavenly places. In modern English, that's outer space. We have demons, ghosts from outer space that have body oh, angels. Millions and billions of people and now they're all professing their devotion to the devil. There you go. Yeah, they're in control so. of government and they're coming after Christians. Yeah, and you know, this is the whole body snatching thing. That's where we get into a lot of agendas right now that we can't talk about on the public platforms, but make sure to donate, support the channel, um, get access to our private shows, right? Dropbox, got the Dropbox updated, Patreon, um, subscription on YouTube. You can check it out when we get into the deeper conspiracies for those that support. Make sure to donate to the channel anyways. Um, it just helps keep us going, helps keep me going. Um, you know, this is my income. This is, you know, it's about getting the truth out there. <laughs> you know, it's about getting the truth out there. This is, um, it's a fucking crazy time, is it not? You know, a crazy time. You know, let's kind of look here at some of this too. This is the Mahatma Letters, AP Senate. It's well known among students of theosophy and occultism that the philosophical doctrines and ethics which were given to the world through the Theosophical Society during the 16 years immediately following its foundation in 1875 emanated from certain Eastern teachers said to belong to an occult brotherhood living in the trans-Himalayan fastness of Tibet. Tibetan Book of the Dead. You know, we've, we've even covered that on this channel. H.P. Blavatsky who, together with Colonel Olcott, founded the Theosophical Society, acknowledged these Eastern brothers as her teachers, stating not only that they existed, but that she herself had received training and instruction at their hands during her sojourn in Tibet and was therefore able to speak from her own knowledge and personal experience. So, yeah. That's what the claim is. That's what the claim is, the Mahatma letters, spirits, and this is philosophical and theoretical teaching, spirits, those who can no longer err, but these appear on earth, but at the origin of every new humankind, at the junction of and close of, the two ends of the great cycle, and they remain with man no longer than the time required for the eternal truths they teach to impress themselves so forcibly upon the plastic mind of the new races as to warrant them from being lost or entirely forgotten in ages hereafter. By the forthcoming generations, the missions of the planetary spirit is but to strike the keynote of truth. Once he has directed the vibration of the latter to run its course uninterruptedly along the catenation of that race and to the end of the cycle, the denizen of the highest inhabited sphere disappears from the surface of our planet till the following resurrection of flesh, right? We've talked about the resurrection and, you know, um, uh, Messiah and apotheosis. The vibration of the primitive truth are what your philosophers name innate ideas. Imperator men had repeatedly told him that in occultism alone, he should seek for and will find a phase of truth 
not yet known to him. But that did not prevent S.M. at all from turning his back upon occultism whenever a theory of it clashed with one of his own preconceived spiritualistic ideas. You know, we see many people do that just to keep it real. And when it comes to the occult, um, the hermetically sealed, the occulted and hidden, right? Um, it's like if it clashes with, you know, people's religious ideas, political ideas, like they, they don't care if it's true or not, you know, what's backing it up, <laughs> what the foundation is, like they don't want to hear it, they try to justify it if it brings fear out in them, anything. To him, mediumship appeared as a charter of his soul's freedom, as resurrection from spiritual death. He had been allowed to enjoy it only so far as it was necessary for the confirmation of his faith promised that the abnormal would yield to the normal, ordered to prepare for the time when the self within him would become conscious of its spiritual, independent existence, will act and talk face to face with its instructor and will lead its life in spiritual spheres normally and without external and internal mediumship at all, and yet once conscious of what he terms external spirit action, he recognized no more hallucination from truth, the false from the real, confounding at times elementals and elementaries, embodied from disembodied spirits. Though he had been often enough told of and warned against those spirits that hover about the earth sphere by his voice of God, with all that he firmly believes to have invariably acted under Empire's direction, and that such spirits as have come to him came by his guide's permission. In such a case as HPB, which is Blavatsky, was there by Empire's consent? And how do you reconcile the following contradictions? Ever since 1876, acting under direct orders, she tried to awaken him to the reality of what was going on around and in him. That she must have acted either according to or against Emperor's will, he must know. As in the latter case, she might boast of being stronger and more powerful than his guide, who never yet protested against an intrusion. Now, what happens? Waiting to her from the Isle of Wight in 1876 of a vision lasting for over 48 consecutive hours he had, and during which he walked about, talked as usual, but did not preserve the slightest remembrance of anything external, he asked her to tell him whether it was a vision or a hallucination. Why he did not ask, I are. You can tell me for, for you were there, he says. You changed, yet yourself, if you have a self. I suppose you have, but into that I do not pry. At another time he saw her in his own library looking at him, approaching, and giving some Masonic signs of the lodge he knows. He admits that he saw her as clearly as he saw Massey who was there. He saw her on several other occasions and sometimes knowing in which HPB he could not recognize her. You seem to me from your appearance as your letters so different at times. The mental attitude so various that it is quite conceivable to me as I am authoritatively told that you are a bundle of entities. I have absolute faith in you. In every letter of his he clamored for a living brother to her unequivocal statement that there was only there was one already having charge of him. He strongly object, objected when he helped to get free from his too material body, absent from it for hours and days sometimes, his empty machine running during that period from afar and by external living influence. As soon as back he would begin laboring under the ineradicable impression of having been all that time the vehicle for another intelligence, a disembodied, not embodied spirit, truth never once flashing across his mind. Imperator, he wrote to her, traverses your idea about mediumship. He says, there should be no real antagonism between the medium and the adept. He had used the word seer instead of medium, the idea would have been rendered more correctly, for a man becomes rarely in a death without being born a natural seer. Then again, in September 1875, 
He knew nothing of the brothers of the shadow, our greatest, most cruel, and, why not confess it, our most potential enemies. In that year, he actually asked the old lady whether Bulware had been eating underdone pork chops and dreaming when he described that hideous dweller of the threshold. Make yourself ready, she answered. In about twelve more months, you will have to face and fight with them. In October 1876, they had begun their work upon him. I am fighting, he wrote. A hand-to-hand -hand battle with all the legions of the fiend for the past three weeks. My nights are made hideous with their torments, temptations, and foul suggestions. I see them all around glaring at me, gabbling, howling, grinning. Every form of filthy suggestion, of bewildering doubt, of mad and shuddering fear is upon me. I can understand Zanani's dweller now. I have not wavered yet, and their temptations are fainter, the presence less near, the horror less. One night she had prostrated herself before her superior, one of the few things they fear, praying him to wave his hand across the ocean lest S.M. should die and the Theo society lose its best subject. He must be tried, was the answer. He imagines that the emperor had sent to tempters because the S.M. was one of those Thomases who must see. He would not believe and could not help their coming. Watch over him he did. He could not drive them away unless the victim, the neophyte himself, proved the strongest. But did these human fiends in league with the elementaries prepare him for a new life as he thought they would? Embodiments of those adverse influences which beset the inner self struggling to be free and to progress. They would never have returned had he successfully conquered them by asserting his own independent will, by giving up his mediumship, his passive will. Yet they did. And I mean, wow. You know... Wow. Just kind of looking at these Mahatma letters, right? <laughs> um, you know, the channeling, and we see this so prominent now. People claiming to channel, you know, Pleiadians, channel Arcturians, to channel Archangel Michael, Raphael, Gabriel. Um, you know, and this kind of taps us into, you know, tarot, astrology, divination, uh, mediums, right? Those who talk to the dead, you know. Um, and one can even ask, you know, like taking us to kind of like the Illuminati vein of all of this, like those who are illuminated, those with the hidden hand, really, um, within these societies, right? This conscious network of illuminated beings on the planet that are nudging humanity in a particular way so when we ask the question at the beginning is this new age movement is this a mass awakening um of this new spiritual movement this new you know new age spiritual movement or a mass indoctrination into rosicrucianism freemasonry and luciferianism or is the illuminated the illuminati nudging humanity in this direction and we're naturally going in this on our own you know because of um the increase in frequency and consciousness and have this always been the planet you know is god a higher power angels pushing us in this direction you know you know one one could really you know you know look at this quite quite a few different ways honestly now i'm going to jump over here let me quit before we jump into the other planets and all of this. This is from William Cooper, Bill Cooper. The Hour of the Time Mystery Babylon series from May 12th, 1993, Hour 19. And this is from the show Lucifer Worship. Becon Nere Universelle. I'm not a French speaker, folks, so that's the best I can do. My tongue doesn't do those things. Or at least I haven't practiced to make my tongue do those things. That title tr translated from French to English means The Woman and Child in Universal French Masonry. A copy of that page that contains that quote and the cover of the book has been supplied to this author, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, by a concerned researcher who had someone locate the book in France for him and make copies of the pertinent pages. The author has read another book that contains the English translation of that encyclical. 
That book is entitled Occult Theocracy and was written in 1933 by Edith Starr Miller. 1933. She cites the book by Mr. De La Rive as her source. She obviously believed that the letter was true and contained the actual thoughts of Mr. Albert Pike. He said it in so many other places, including in his own book, Morals and Dogma. Which we're going to look at the letters of Albert Pike um, as well, and Morals and Dogma as well. That I also believe that the letter is true, and now I'm speaking as myself, William Cooper. In other words, going back to A. Ralph Epperson's words, in other words, the only source for the letter is a Frenchman who quotes it in his book and not Mr. Albert Pike himself. It must be assumed that Mr. Pike, if he were alive today and was asked whether the letter was his, would deny that he ever wrote such an encyclical, whether or not he had written it, because he must. He's sworn to maintain the secrets. But the reader is admonished to remember that if he did indeed worship Lucifer and wrote the encyclical, he would certainly have to deny it, so that answer would tell the researcher nothing. It is the contention of this writer, A. Ralph Epperson, and others who are attempting to decipher the secret symbols of the Masonic order that a small percentage of the Masons know that all of the symbols inside the lodge refer to Lucifer. And I am one of those who believe this, folks. My research has shown it to be absolutely true, and I can prove it. And I've already, I've already uh, given you direct quotes from many Freemasons that already prove it. And it must be remembered that these Masons must, of necessity, do all that they can to deny any, any revelation of any of the secrets of the Lodge. And certainly anyone today who believes that the contents of the letter are a fraud would do all that they could to discredit anyone who said that the thoughts were the actual thoughts of Pike. However, this writer, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, is of the opinion that Mr. Pike did indeed worship Lucifer and is not basing that conclusion on just this one letter. Notice that Mr. Pike has written elsewhere that he considered Lucifer to be the secret god of the Masonic Lodge, and I, William Cooper, have also found that to be true. Now, let's take a look here at some of the letters from Pike. I believe it's right here. Yeah, let's take a look at this one first. All right. Here is some of what I discovered, okay? And this is I wrote not about Mark Hatfield's tenure as legislator, governor, senator, but about his affiliation with a fraternal order that by his own admission shows its source to be Satan. I've researched this fairly extensively and I've found no evidence that Senator Hatfield has renounced his oath of allegiance to this order because he represented our state and the United States Senator and his long membership in good standing with Masonic order likewise binds Oregon or citizenry to that organization. Here's some of what I discovered. First, Albert Pike, foremost spokesman for Freemasonry, said, quote, That which we must say to the crowd is we worship a god, but it is the god one adores without superstition. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspector General, we say this, and you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians, whose deeds prove cruelty, perfidy, and hatred of man, barbarism, and repulsion for science, would Adonai and his priest culminate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary for light to serve as its foil as the pedestal is necessary to the statue and the brake to the locomotive. Thus the doctrine of Satanism is heresy and the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. 
Albert Pike was not only a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Lodge member and wrote, among other books, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which is given to new Masonic initiates. He was also a Confederate Brigadier General in the Civil War and instrumental in founding and later a Chief Judicial Officer in the Ku Klux Klan. The Luciferian doctrine that Pike speaks of is Satan's bold, determined declaration of being equal with the Creator and one true living God of our universe, the Grand Architect, the All-Seeing Eye. The Masons serve and worship is not Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rather, it is Satan. All the works of good nature and benevolent service that members perform cannot possibly make right the foundation of wickedness the organization is in reality built upon. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. The Bible tells us secret organizations are forbidden. Not all the people who sound religious are really godly. They may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they obey my Father in heaven. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. But I say, don't make any vows. If you say by heaven, it is a sacred vow because heaven is God's throne. And if you say by earth, it is a sacred vow because the earth is his footstool. And don't swear by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Don't even swear by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Your word is enough to strengthen your promise with a vow shows that something is wrong. Try and find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But when the light shines on them, it becomes clear how evil these things are. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. And how can goodness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? And what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? And for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and separate yourselves from them. Say the Lord, don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. For everything that is hidden or secret will eventually be brought to the light and made plain to all. So be sure to pay attention to what you hear. To those who are open to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But to those who are not listening, even what they think will have to be taken away from them. The day will surely come when God, by Jesus Christ, will judge everyone's secret life. This is my message. How about that? Right? Morals and Dogma about by Albert Pike, and this is of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the sun, to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light, and with its splendor, intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. You can see here, right, the titles and degrees. And you remember the 30th, 31st, and 32nd degree, Knight Kadash, Inspector, Inquisitor, Master of the Royal Secret. You know, that's, you know, when they say they should be taught about uh, Lucifer. Going back to this too, let's go, it's right here worshipped the traditional God so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun God, by the name of Lucifer. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their God whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out. Well, of course, folks, they're sworn to secrecy. They have to deny anything about the true secrets of their order. I mean, what kind of logic is this? That's plain as the nose in your face. You must understand that when you ask a Mason a question about Freemasonry, he's going to tell you a lie because he is sworn to secrecy, and he is sworn by blood oaths. 
And I know that by the time they've reached the 32nd degree, they've taken at least 32 different oaths swearing them to secrecy. Minimum. So, you should know this already. Now, let's continue, but I'm going to go back and read that part over. It appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional God so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun-god by the name of Lucifer. It's very important. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their god whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out as I and many others have done, as A. Ralph Epperson has done. So the secret inside the Masonic Order is that Lucifer is their secret god. Any non-Mason today who attempts to explain to any of their Masonic friends or relatives that this is the secret inside the Lodge will be met with an instantaneous denial. Every Mason, whether they know the secret of the Lodge or not, will obviously deny the accusation because they must. Mr. Pike continued, quote, You may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. Oh the God. Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine, unquote. You see, Albert Pike at that time was at the head of all the lodges of Freemasonry of the world and at the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States of America. And we know, Here Mr. Pike seems to indicate we know too that, that is, it is the 30th, 31st, and 32nd uh, Pike also did the 1871 letter to Matini outlining the three world wars and We'll pull that up too really fast. Let's close some of this down. Yeah, morals and dogma. A bridge between the ceremonies of degrees or lectures of morals and dogma. A bridge to light. And In the Three World Wars, the Social Cataclysm, here we go, I'm really just considered, concerned with the, the last one, alright, this is the Illuminati plan for Three World Wars, 18, or August 5th, 1871, letter to Mazzini, let's take a look here. Yeah, here we go. The Third World War must be fermented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agentor of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionists and the State of Israel mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion, and we shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist. We shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which, in all its horror, will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute, absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then, everywhere, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into the public view. This manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. And there you have it, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. 
And when you read or look at the Jesuit oath, you know, and what, you know, the, you know, to exterminate and annihilate the, their execrable race and all of this, like, you know, and the Jesuit Pope and, you know, how we've seen Freemasonry, um, you know, take over Christianity and we see how it's used politically too through, you know, Marxism and socialism. Matter of fact, um, taking a look here, uh, in a matter of some regret to me, I have been for unable to continue to study the French Revolution, the Chevalier de Boufflers and the French Revolution, the study of democracy formed, the state of the world at the end of the Great War seemed to demand an inquiry in the present phase of the revolutionary movement, right, in these revolutions, um, this rebellion, right? Uh, but the state of the world at the end of the Great War seemed to demand, da da da. Now, before the returning to that first cataclysm, I have felt impelled to devote one more book to the revolution. Remember, the three world wars, this was all about, this already, the first two world wars happened to a T, by the way, right? The Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Nazis in Germany, all of that, of Pike's letter to Mazzini. And the third world war is right on time, too. So, uh, the revolution by a whole, giving this time further back in the past, attempting to trace its origins for the century of the Christian era. The Bolshevik Revolution, out of political and social conditions, the French Revolution did not arise merely out of conditions or ideas peculiar to the 18th century, nor the Bolshevist Revolution out of the political and social conditions in Russia, or the teaching of Karl Marx. Both these explosions were produced by forces which, making use of popular suffering and discontent had long been gathering strength for an onslaught not only on Christianity but on all social and moral order. And we just showed you, you know, the social cataclysm, Christianity, all of that, right? And the letters. Okay? So, I mean, <laughs> honestly, think about it. You know, this shit, it's really, it's, it's fucking crazy at this point. You know, when we talk about illumination, right, and being illuminated it takes us to the, you know, the shining ones, right? Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Gods. This is Osiris and Isis and Ra, the sun god. Behold, O ye shining ones, ye men and gods, ye damned ones, when ye behold Osiris Ani, triumphant like unto Horus and adored by reason of the unrewrecked crown. If fall ye down upon your faces, for Osiris, Ani is victorious over his foes in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, and in the presence of the godlike rulers of all the gods and goddesses. I am the Lord of the Red Crown, which is on the head of the Shining One, he who gives life to mankind from the heat of his mouth, and who delivers Ra from a peppy. Right, and Ra, um, the sun god, right, Mayat, truth, Light and Apep or Pepe, Apophis, right? A god of chaos and darkness. Okay, we've talked a lot about this on this channel, right? And how they correlate to Jupiter and all of this. I am the, the Lord of the Red Crown, right? Which is on the head of the Shining One. Okay, the Shining One, that's Lucifer, Prometheus. Right, and looking at Egypt too, it's also the, the Illuminated One, right? And we're, we're going to go into this too here in a second. Start here. Close this out. We're going to take a look at you know, Mercury. Um, Mercury, the major god in Roman mythology, being one of the twelve with the ancient Roman pantheon, the god of financial gain, commerce, eloquence, messages, communication, divination, travelers, boundaries, luck, trickery, and thieves. He also serves as the guide, guide of the souls to the underworld. In Roman mythology, he is considered to be either the son of Maya, right, or Maya, um, the dream world, Maya, or the seven daughters, there's the seven, of the Titan Atlas, Atlas of the Atlantic, Atlantis, and Jupiter, right, or Silas or Dias. He, in his earliest forms, appears to have been the Etruscan deity terms. Both gods share characteristics of the Greek god Hermes, 
was often depicted holding the caduceus in his left hand, similar to the Greek equivalent Hermes. He was awarded a magic wand by Apollo, Apollos, Apophis, which later turned into caduceus, the staff of the intertwined snakes. You can see. Mercurius. Messenger of the gods. Merchandise, merchant, commerce, Macari, trade, wages. Um, boundary, border. Old Norse, it means a mark. Right? Mark of the beast. Um, also, Jupiter. And Jupiter, who was the Ju or day or sky, right? Sun in the morning, right? Sky, uh, sky father, or known as Jove, right? Jehovah, Jove given, the god of the sky, the thunder, the king of the gods, the ancient Roman religion and mythology. Jupiter was a chief deity of the Roman state of religion through Republican and Imperial eras until Christianity became the dominant religion of the empire. In Roman mythology, he negotiates with Numa Pompilus, the second king of Rome, to establish principles such as offering or sacrifice. He sought to have originated as a sky god, identifying and implement as a thunderbolt, lightning, electric, El, Elohim. His primary sacred animal is the eagle, right? Um, Inky as well. Which is precedence over the birds is taking of auspices and became one of the most common symbols of the Roman army. The two emblems combined to represent the god in the form of the eagle and its claw and a thunderbolt and Greek and Roman coins. As a sky god, he was divine witness to Os, sacred trust on which justice, good, and government depend. Many of the functions were focused on Capitoline Hill, where the citadel was located, or the Capitoline Triad. He was a central guardian of the state with Juno and Minerva, the owl. His sacred tree was the oak. They regarded Jupiter as the equivalent of Zeus. Um, the myths and iconography of Zeus, under the name Lupiter, the Greek influence tradition, Jupiter was the brother of Neptune and Pluto. Right? Neptune dreams, Pluto, Lord of the Underworld. The Roman equivalents of Poseidon and Hades, the Lord of the Water. Ea, Lord of the Water. Inki, Lord of the Earth. And Hades, Hillel, right? Pluto, Mercury. Each presided over one of the three realms of the universe, sky, the waters, the underworld, and the italic Despiter, who was also the sky god, manifested himself in the daylight also identified with Jupiter, right? So we see the daylight, the darkness, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, um, Mercury, right? The sun, uh, this plays out over and over and over again, guys, you know, and you see that it is the stars or the planets, right? And there's always a God of light and a God of darkness. We've seen the Maya, right? The Maya, the Maya, right? And kind of looking at that, Jupiter, the god of sacrifice, Maya human sacrifice. Warfare among the Maya was considerably different from modern combat where opposing forces attempt to annihilate their enemies entirely on the field of battle. First of all, the Maya world was divided into um, parties and city-states that would at times be at peace and under different circumstances fight. The aim would rather be limited warfare to take prisoners. Um, captives generally wound up as slaves, but high-status captives were scheduled for ritual sacrifice. The deliberate taking of a human life was deemed necessary to sanctify certain ritual occasions, such as the ascendancy to the throne, ascending to the throne by a new ruler or dedication of a new building. Naturally, the capture of a rival ruler was highly priced, as the sacrifice of the unfortunate individual lent extra importance to the occasion. The usual method of sacrifice was decapitation in a public ceremony, right? Cut the head off the serpent. Okay. And looking at the Mayan gods, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent or plumed serpent, all the way back to the beginning, right? Serpent in the Bible. Um, Nahudi, named for the feathered serpent deity, the ancient Mesoamerican culture and the Mesoamerican myth Quetzalcoatl is a mythical culture hero from whence all Amer Mesoamerican peoples claim descent. These myths also describe him as the divine ruler of the myth mythical Toltecs or Talan after his expulsion from Talan, traveled south or east to set up new cities or kingdoms. <clears throat> 
The name Quetzalcoatl literally means feathered snake, right? Flying serpent, like the eagle, right? The bird, right? Feathered serpent or a dragon, right? A fabulous kind of serpent. The Nahuatl word Quetzal means long green feathers, Molina, but later came to be applied also to a bird who gave these feathers, the resplendent Quetzal. Quetzal feathers were a rare and precious commodity in the Aztec culture, so the combination of Quetzali, precious feather, and Quetzal snake has often been interpreted as signifying a serpent with the feathers of a Quetzal. The meaning of the local name of the Mesoamerican language is similar. The Maya of Yucatan knew him as Cucucan, or the Quiche Maya of Guatemala as Cucumats. Both names can be translated as feather snake. The feathered serpent deity was important. Um, the pre-classic era, the conquest, they were the, the Olmecs, Mixtecs, Toltecs, Aztecs, adopted it from the people of Tihuacan and the Maya. The cult of the serpent is very old. Uh, representations of snakes and bird-like characteristics as old as the Olmecs. The snake represents the earth and vegetation, but it was Tihuacan around 150 BC where the snake got the precious feathers of the Quetzal. And his brother, Tatikalapoca, the smoking mirror, god of the great bear constellation of the night sky, one of the major deities of the Aztec pantheon. Tatikalapoca's cult was brought to Central Mexico by the Toltecs, Nahua speaking warriors from the north about the end of the 10th century AD. Numerous myths relate to Tatikalapoca, expelled the priest king, Quetzalcoatl. Toth, the Atlantean priest king. We're going to look at Toth and Hermes and all that too. The feathered serpent from the latter center of Tula, a protean wizard. Chetzikalapoca caused the death of many Toltecs by his black magic and induced the virtuous Quetzalcoatl to sin, drunkenness, and carnal love, thus putting an end to the Toltec golden age. Under his influence, the practice of human sacrifice was introduced into central Mexico. Tetsikalapoca's Nagual, or animal disguise, was the Jaguar, right? The Jaguar. Um, the spotted skin, which was compared to the starry sky. We see the Jaguar, the leopard, uh, represented Lucifer a lot too, um, uh, especially in Egyptian mythology. A creator god, Tetsikalapoca, ruled the Asala Tunicha, the Jaguar's son, the first of the four worlds that was created and destroyed before the present universe. Moving forward. I'm going to take this where I want to go. Right here. Here we go. We'll start with... Hermes. All right, Hermes Trismegistus. We talked about Hermes and the Caduceus. Hermes Trismegistus, Greek for Hermes the Thrice Greatest, or Mercurius, Der Maximus in Latin, Mercury, right? the syncretism of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Toth, or Thoth. In Hellenistic Egypt, Hellel, Helen, right? Hellenistic Egypt, the god Hermes was given the epithet, the Greek name of Thoth. He also had been identified with Enoch. Other similar syncretized gods include Serapis, like Seraphim, and Hermanubis, right? Anubis, the dog god, right? And we're going to look at that too. You know, Dogon, right? All of that. Um, Hermes Trismegistus might also be explained in euphemist fashion as a man who was a son of God. And in the Kabbalistic tradition that was inherited by the Renaissance, it could be imagined that such a personage had been contemporary with Moses, communicating to a line of adepts a parallel wisdom. A historian, however, would leave such speculation to the history of the alchemy in the 19th century of history of occultism. Both Toth and Hermes were gods of writing and magic in their respective cultures. The Greek god of interpretive communication was combined with the Egyptian god of wisdom as a patron of astrology and alchemy. In addition, both gods were psychopomps guiding souls to the afterlife. The majority of Greek and later Roman did not accept Hermes Trismegistus in place of Hermes. 
The two gods remain distinct from one another. And the lord of the underworld, right, all that Mercury, Pluto, right? See the planets? They continue to pop up over and over. The hermetic literature added to the Egyptian concerned with the conjuring spirits and animating statues that informed the oldest text. Hellenistic writings in Greco-Babylonian astrology and the newly developed practice of alchemy in a parallel tradition hermetic philosophy rationalized and systematized religious cult practices and offered the adept a method of personal ascension there's the ascension again from the constraints of physical being which has led to the confusion of hermeticism with Gnosticism, which we've also looked at, which was developing contemporaneously Dan Mercur, stages of ascension and hermetic rebirth. As a divine fountain of writing, Hermes Trismegistus was credited with tens of thousands of writings of high standing, reputed to be of immense antiquity. Plato's Timaeus and Critias state that in the temple of Neith and Sias, there was a secret hall containing historical records, which had been kept for 9,000 years. Clement of Alexandria was under the impression that the Egyptians in 42 sacred writings by Hermes, encapsulating all the training of Egyptian priests, see Creek from Marantz, as suggested in Egyptian religion, the reference to Toth's authorship is based on the ancient tradition, and the 42 probably stems from the number of Egyptian gnomes, and thus conveys a notion of completeness. The Neoplatonic writers took up Clement's 42 essential texts in like 42 months as well, right? In the Bible, time, time, and half a time, right? Or three and a half years, okay? Um, you know, and, and looking at Hermes, right? The thrice great, the thrice born, right? The Trinity, right? We see all of this, and you see Greco-Babylonian astrology, like it's all connected. The so-called literature of the Hermetica is a category of papyri containing spells, induction procedures, and the dialogue of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing, the art of imprisoning the souls of demons or angels in statues with the help of herbs, gems, odors, is described and the statue could speak and prophesy. In other papyri, there are other recipes for constructing such images and animating them, such as images to be fashioned in a hollow so as to enclose a magic name inscribed on a golden leaf. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, known as the Hermetica, enjoyed great credit and were popular among alchemists. The Hermetic tradition, therefore, refers to alchemy, magic, astrology, and related subjects. The texts are usually distinguished in two categories, the philosophical and technical Hermetica. So you have kind of like your theosophical, right, your astro theology or philosophy right psychology um you know and then you know the technical or medical which would be like your sacred sciences right the scientific side uh you know astrology numerology right all of that um you know of the metaphysics the former deals many with mainly with issues of philosophy and the latter with magic potions and alchemy among other things there are spells to magically protect objects, hence the origin of the term hermetically sealed. Right? So we have a cult, which means to hide, to hide something, to be hidden. Hermetic means to be sealed. Um, and we know that um, you know arcane is sealed as well. Right? So all this kind of starts back then too. Moving forward, Hermes prophecy, right? There will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. The gods will return from earth to heaven, Egypt will be forsaken, and the land which was once the home of religion will be left desolate, bereft of the presence of its deities. They will no longer love this world around us, the incomparable work of God, the glorious structure which he has built, the sum of good, made up of many device for diver, the diverse forms, the instrument whereby the will of God operates and that which he has made, ungrudgingly favoring man's welfare. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed insane, the impious wise. The madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. As for the soul and the belief, that it is immortal by nature or may hope to attain to immortality, as I have taught you, all this they will mock, and even will persuade themselves that it is false. No word of reverence or piety, no utterance worthy of heaven, will be heard or believed. 
And so, the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing, and only evil angels will remain, who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manners of reckless crime, into wars, robberies, frauds, and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Then will the earth tremble and the sea bear no ships. Heavens will not support the stars in their orbits and all the voices of the gods will be forced in the silence. The fruit of the earth will rot, the soil will turn barren, and the very air will sicken with sullen stagnation and all things will be disordered and awry. All good will disappear. But when all this has befallen, then God, the creator of all things, will look on that which has come to pass and will stop the disorder by the counterforce of his will which is the good. He will call back to the right path those who have gone astray. He will cleanse the world of evil, washing it away with floods, burning it out with the fiercest fire, and expelling it with war and pestilence. How about that? Right? Very interesting prophecy of Hermes. Okay? And remember, Hermes in his connection to Toth and Lucifer and the architect. So, Toth the architect. Toth, who played a crucial role in the design and orientation of many famous pyramids, temples, and ziggurats in the December 20, 2000 travel to Egypt, there met a researcher. He told me that the name Khufu is found more than one cartouche in the relief chamber above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid. Khufu was credited with building the Great Pyramid. Khufu was Toth. The first races can be authenticated in the pyramid text, where a union with the Ibis Toth takes place in the marshy area of the delta. The pyramid texts were a collection of Egyptian mortuary prayers, hymns, and spells intended to protect a dead king or queen and ensure life and substance in the hereafter. The text inscribed on the walls of the inner chambers of the pyramids uh, from 2686 to 2160 BC are found at Sagara and several 5th and 6th dynasty pyramids of which Unas, last king of the 5th dynasty, in the, is the earliest known. The texts constitute the oldest surviving body of Egyptian religious and funerary writings available to modern scholars. In one role or another, Toth played a crucial part in the design and orientation of the pyramids aligned with Orion and each other, Toth's chamber. Wow. Toth and astronomy. Toth made calculations concerning the heavens, the stars, and the earth, the reckoner of times and seasons, the one who measured out the heavens and planned the earth. He was he who balances the god of the equilibrium. And remember, Anubis has the scales, right? against the feather, the master of the balance, the lord of the divine body, the scribe of the company of the gods, and Enoch, the scribe, right, Jesus, the word, right, uh, the voice of Ra, the author of every work on every branch of knowledge, both human and divine, he who understood all that is hidden under the heavenly vault. Toth in mythology, and notice he has a bird head, right, we've talked about that. Toth has played a prominent role in many of the Egyptian myths, Displaying his role as arbitrator, he has overseen three epic battles between good and evil. All three battles are fundamentally the same and belong to different periods. The first battle took place between Ra and Apep, the second between Heru and Bekutet and Set, and the third between Horus, the son of Osiris, and Set. Right? Set, Satan, Temple of Set, Maga, Magus, right? You know, Cyrus, one so infinitely resurrecting spirit or the god of death. In each instance, the former god represented order while the latter represented chaos. They were, one god was seriously injured. Toth would heal them to prevent either from overtaking the other. Toth was also prominent in the Osiris myth, being of great aid to Isis. After Isis gathered together the pieces of Osiris's dismembered body, he gave her the words to resurrect him so that he could be impregnated and bring forth. Horus. When Horus was slain, Toth gave the formula to resurrect him as well, similar to God speaking the words to create the heavens and earth in Judeo-Christian mythology. Toth being the God who always speaks the words that fulfill the wishes of Ra, spoke the words that created the heavens and earth in Egyptian mythology. 
This mythology also credits him with the creation of the 365-day lunar calendar. We know the 365 in Abraxas and Eremon and how that connects to Christ and um, Simon Magus and all of that. According to the myth, the year was only 360 days long and Newt, right, or knew it, Newt, right, the, the night god, Nox, Pan, was sterile during these days, unable to bear children. Uh, Toth gambled with Khonsu, the moon, and one seventy-second of its light, or five days in one. During these five days, Newt gave birth to Kerur-Yor, or Ur, right, the land of Ur, Horus the Elder, the face of heaven, Osiris set Isis, and Nephthys. You see there, right? In the Ogdod, Cosmogeny, Toth gave birth to Ra, Atom, Nephertum, Kepri, by laying an egg while in the form of Ibis, and later a goose laying a golden egg. And this is the micro, macro, the cosmic egg, or womb, right down to the cell, right? Creation, universe, cells, wombs, right? It's all micro, macro. Toast's roles in Egyptian mythology were many. He served as a mediating power, especially between good and evil, making sure neither had a decisive victory over the other. The ancient Egyptians regarded Toth as one, self-begotten and self-produced. He was a master of both physical and moral, i.e. divine law, making proper use of mayat. He is credited with making the calculations for the establishment of the heavens, stars, earth, and everything in them. Compare this to how his feminine counterpart, Mayot, truth in Mayot, right, light, was the force which maintained the universe. He is said to direct the motions of the heavenly bodies. Without his words, the Egyptians believed that gods would not exist. His power was almost unlimited in the underworld and rivaled that of Ra and Osiris. The Egyptians credited him as the author of all works of science, religion, philosophy, and magic. The Greeks further declared him the inventor of astronomy, astrology, the science of numbers, which is numerology, mathematics, geometry, land surveying, medicine, botany, theology, civilized government, the alphabet, reading, writing, and oratory. They further claimed he was the one true author of every work of every branch of knowledge, human and divine. Egyptologists disagree on toast nature, Depending on their view of the Egyptian pantheon, most Egyptologists today side with Sir Flinders Petrie that Egyptian religion was strictly polytheistic in which Toth would be a separate god. Toth and Sishat, the tree of life. His feminine counterpart was Seshat, who was described to the gods who kept a great library of scrolls of which Seshat, the goddess of writing, was thought to be mistress. He was associated by the Egyptians with speech, literature, arts, and learning. Both he and Sishat were measurers and recorders of time. Many Egyptians believed Sishat invented writing while Toth taught writing to mankind. She was known as mistress of the house of books, indicating that she also took care of Toth's library of spells and scrolls. Sishat, the goddess of libraries. And think about the library of Alexandria. Right? All forms of writing. Look at that. And the measurement of time. And we know, you know, Hermes, right, which is Mercury, and Aphrodite, Venus, Hermaphrodite, right? The masculine feminine, told the scribe, you know, Prometheus, um, you know, still in the divine sparks of life, right? Um, Hopping out of the cosmic egg before time, right? Having both sexes. Toth described, right? It all goes back to Lucifer, guys, every time. Toth became credited by the ancient Egyptians as the inventor of writing and alphabets, i.e. hieroglyphs themselves. He was also considered to have both been the scribe of the underworld and uh, the moon, and the moon became occasionally considered as a separate entity, and Toth had less association with it and more with, with wisdom. For this reason, Toth was universally worshipped by ancient Egyptian scribes. Toth became credited as the inventor of the 365-day calendar. I mean, it's all, you know, Toth and Mayat involved in arbitration, magic, writing, science, and the judging of the dead. Toth in the Book of the Dead. Right? Tibet, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, right? And all this with the Sumerian. That's where the Bible comes from, right? All of these. In the underworld, Duat, 
Toth up in its dual, right, appeared as an ape, Aeon, and the god of equilibrium, right? And we reported the scales weighing the deceased heart against the feather, representing the principle of Mayot, was exactly even. Mayot is depicted as a tall woman wearing a crown, surmounted by a huge ostrich feather. Mayot was the ancient Egyptian concept of truth, balance, order, law, morality, and justice who is sometimes personified as a goddess regulating the stars, seasons, and the actions of both mortals and deities, who set the order of the universe from chaos to the moment of creation. Later, as a goddess in other traditions, the Egyptian pantheon, where the goddess was paired with the male aspect, her male masculine counterpart was Toth, and the attributes are the same. So there you have it, right? Basically in everything. You know, and that takes us to, you know, a caduceus. Right, the caduceus, right, the serpent coiling up the staff, right, the staff representing the kingship or power, the spine, right, activation, and this is the kundalini activation. Kundalini, the Sanskrit word meaning either coiled up or coiling like a snake. As a matter of fact, let's go to this video really quick. I'm going to show this video real fast. We are at the dawn of a new age, the age of Aquarius. The past 20 or 30 years, there's been a big boom in meditation of all varieties in the West. There's no limitation in space when you go into thought consciousness. So that's where the, the meditative state is so key. When you transcend, you go beyond thought. You just experience pure consciousness. Consciousness is all possibility. It is all potential. Most people have experienced other dimensions and what have you, uh, either in meditation or near-death experiences or just spontaneously. And it's sort of an awakening that happens in consciousness. There's not going to be a second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is you. It's all of us. It is the awakening of the Christ principle in humanity. With this information comes the potential for what is called apotheosis. Human becomes God. And they have a variety of practices, very distinct practices, which are engineered to awaken your psychic center. Genesis gives us a clear origin for this belief in human divinity, unfortunately dismissed as a fairy tale by much of the world today, including many Christians. The Genesis account of the creation and fall of man not only gives us a clear explanation of why the world and mankind have been continuously plagued by chaos, death, and destruction throughout the centuries, but it also provides a clear picture of where the world is headed and why many of those currently in power hold a Luciferian worldview and are tirelessly working to build a one-world society. Society. Even if you dismiss the book of Genesis as nothing but a fairy tale, the truth of the matter is that many of the people working to forge a new world order hold to a spiritual worldview that takes the Genesis account very seriously. The only difference is they interpret it from the other side. The caduceus. You know, and it's like... <laughs> I feel like we really dug deep into this tonight. I mean, I'm going to look at a little bit more before I get out of here. 
Um, but I really want to see what you think in the comments down below. I would love to hear your thoughts. Is this a mass awakening? Right? Spiritual movement. It's happening naturally. You know? Um, awareness of human consciousness. And we're doing it through the sacred sciences and metaphysics and... You know, all different types of cool, you know, occultic and hermetic schools of thought. Or is it a mass indoctrination into Luciferianism? Is this being guided by the Illuminati to a new world order, one world religion? Um, Kundalini, the Sanskrit word meaning coiled up or coiling like a snake. A uh, number of other translations that usually emphasize the serpent nature of the word or serpent power. The caduceus which is a symbol of the coiling snake, thought to be the ancient symbolic representation, representation of kundalini physiology. The concept of kundalini comes from yogic philosophy, right? Yogis in the ancient India, which refers to the mothering intelligence behind yogic awakening and spiritual maturation. It might be regarded by yogis as a sort of deity, hence the occasional capitalization of the term. With a Western frame of understanding, it's often associated with the practice of contemplative or religious practices that might induce altered states of consciousness, either brought about spontaneously or through a type of yoga, psychedelic drugs, uh, or near-death experience. According to the yogic tradition, uh, Kundalini is curled up in the back part of the root chakra and in three and one half turns around the sacrum. Yogic phenomenology states that the Kundalini awakening is associated with the appearance of bioenergetic phenomena that are said to be experienced somatically by the yogi. This appearance is also referred to as the pranic awakening. Prana is interpreted as the vital life sustaining force in the body. Uplifted or intensified life energy is called pranatana and is supposed to originate from an apparent reservoir of subtle bioenergy at the base of the spine. This energy is also interpreted as a vibrational phenomenon that initiates a period or a process of vibrational spiritual development. Very interesting. And the interpretation of Kundalini. Uh, was presented by Jung, Carl Jung, with the model for the development phases of higher consciousness. He interpreted its symbols in terms of the process of individuation, the psychology of Kundalini Yoga. Western translators interpreted the energetic phenomena as a form of psychic or paranormal energy. Um, and many people believe it's demonic possession in Christianity, right? Uh, Parapsychological psychological or understanding of psychic energy separated from its cultural Hermeneutic or whom hermeneutic matrix is probably not the same as a yogic understanding. Yogic philosophy understands this concept of maturing energy that expresses the individual's sociological longings, uh, viewed in mythological context, sometimes believed to be an aspect of Shakti, the goddess or consort of Shiva, who's the destroyer, right? Um, Kundalini might be said to be the popular concept since it's widely quoted among various disciplines of yoga and New Age beliefs. However, recent popularization of the term within a new religious movement has, according to scholars of religion, not contributed to promote a mature understanding of the concept. As with many Eastern contemplative concepts, there exist considerable difficulties and possible semantic confusion connected to the way these concepts are adapted to Western context. This has led to somewhat different interpretations and applications of the concept of Kundalini within the spiritual and contemplative culture in the West. On the one hand, there are the New Age popularizations, and the other, there's the traditional lineage of Kundalini Yoga, understood from its cultural background and interpreted with the academic fields of religious studies, pastoral theology, and transpersonal humanistic psychology. So yeah, Kundalini Yoga which is meditative discipline, system of meditative techniques and movements. The yogic tradition focuses on psycho-spiritual growth and the body's potential for maturation. Kundalini yoga consists of a number of bodily postures, expressive movements and utterances, characterological cultivations, breathing patterns, and degrees of concentration. The Kundalini rising According to yogic terminology, the force of kundalini is supposed to be raised through meditative exercises and activated within the concept of a subtle body, a body of energy, 
and finer substance. The process has been explained in detail by Matayama and by Sharp. Matayama bases the bulk of the Kundalini raising practices listed in the book of the notable Swami Satyamanda Sarwatsi, as well as on personal experiences and helping others in various stages of Kundalini awakening. Sharp provides Kundalini meditation called the Great Invocation, along with detailed guidance, controlling and managing the energy flow and subsequent manifestation. Experiences are often understood in terms of the Hindu chakra system, the understanding of psycho-spiritual energy centers along the spine. According to Hindu tradition, Kundalini raises from the root chakra through the spinal channel called Sushumana and is believed to activate each chakra as it goes through. Each chakra is said to contain special characteristics in raising Kundalini spiritual powers. Sides are also believed to arise, but many spiritual traditions see these phenomena as obstacles on the path and encourage their students not to get hung up on them. Although the opening of higher chakras are believed to mark advanced spiritual unfoldment, it is important not to measure spiritual growth solely by the opening of higher potentials. According to this view, chakras might be under or overdeveloped and lower chakras are thought to be just as important as the higher. Um, and, you know, uh, there are many practices, you know, that actually activate um, this serpent energy with, within you, right? This prana, right? This awakening and... Um, many practices, schools of thought, and you know, it has to do everything with eating, diet, exercise, meditation, right? Uh, what type of things you're doing for you know, for self initiation and illumination. Spiritual literature also describes instances where it's said to be initiated. Initiation of Kundalini activity, and you know, this is into the mysteries too. Initiation, um, it's a process, this metaphysical process, you know to take people to that apotheosis, that godhood. It is considered to take place by a practice called Shaktipat. This is a form of laying on of hands, where physical contact to the body or the forehead of the subject by the guru, the initiator, are supposed to cause an experience of Kundalini. And you see this, like the oil on the head and, you know, uh, Christianity. Later, persist or grow with continuing practice or fade away if the practice is stopped. Um, Kundalini symptomology, which is associated with such practices as Shakyapad, also gives a case example of the practice from American Meditation Retreat. Okay, so I mean, you know, lots of people believe, you know, the Kundalini, you know, rising and all of this. We're not going to look at it everywhere, but I do see here um, one speculation, uh, the stimulating endocrine glands to work to have a different effect on consciousness, perhaps ultimately stimulating the re release of DMT by the pineal gland, which has an analogous to the pineal chakra, right? The third eye, okay? And um, if we look at other historical figures, Zen master Hakun, St. Teresa, Nietzsche, um, these are the precursors of Kundalini, the potential to diverge into some peculiar types of pathology. So. Lots of the great minds have believed, uh, you know, stepped into this. And we see the chakras, which means the wheel in Sanskrit, the zodiacal wheel, 12 archetypes, right? Let's take this all the way back to that, right? The 12 disciples, consciousness and energy moving from one frequency to another in a spiraling fashion. Right? The seven chakras, the seven lampstands, the body has energy centers that look like spinning wheels and are called chakras. They allow the energy to flow from one part of the body to the other. That awakening in the base, right? And that's where you get, um, you know, the, the, the back door stuff, right? With um, initiation and all of that. So, uh, for stimulating of the uh, vagus nerve, right? What happens in vagus stays in vagus. As with all things in our reality, they're linked to sound, light, and color. It's about frequency and vibration, right? To heal is to bring the chakras into alignment. And remember, we're a reflection, an image, a phantom, an illusion. We are a vibration uh, of light and sound. Then understand the nature of creation as your purpose in it. Think about it. The seven rays, right? The watchers, the archons, the governors, the rulers of this reality. God is light, truth, and mayot, right? And then sound. Lucifer, the god of music, right? It's right there for, uh, for all to see. Um, and you can see it's on the motion and the alchemy of time and this can take us into alchemy and everything right all the sacred sciences stem from this the flow of energy 
the electromagnetic field, which is your aura, your auric field, the chakra wheels, right? Showing you where the chakras are, the crown chakra, the brow chakra, throat chakra, and I call it the third eye chakra, uh, throat chakra, heart chakra, solar plexus, spleen chakra, and root chakra. Chakras above the head bring one into a higher frequency energy. And they range from four fingers to the, the crown chakra. The highest chakra is the soul star. And you can see the third eye, the crown. This is where they emanate in the body. Right. And third eye pineal gland. Twelve round one spiraling tone of creation. And it shows you the, the connection to the seven rays. The colors and all of that. First chakra red. Second orange. Third yellow. Fourth green. Right, these seven days of the week, seven planets, all of it, heart center, blue, indigo, purple, see what I mean? Like it all connects, man, and then this goes into crystals, right, the crystals connecting to the chakras too, that's right, the emerald tablet, which is green, it's Lucifer, it's truth, right, like you see how it all comes back to, in the metals, base metals, iron and Saturn and all of this, right, um, and it's just, it's crazy how you know people don't see you know these connections or you know can't can't grasp these connections like but um, it's been used to take great power and the governments of the world still are doing this pushing for that new world order that was started way back here right Nazism and the occult um, Nazism and occultism describe a range of theories, speculation, research into the origins of Nazism, impossible relation to various occult traditions. Such ideas have been popular in culture since the early 40s, gained renewed popularity in the 60s, and there are documentaries and books on the topic. Um, the Morning of the Magician, Sphere of Destiny, Nazism and Occultism have also been featured in numerous films, novels, comic books, and other fictional media. Perhaps the most prominent is the film Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, conspiracy theorists frequently identify German notch national socialism inter alia as a precursor to the new world order, right, with regard to Hitler's later ambition of imposing a national socialist regime throughout Europe. Uh, Nazi propaganda used the term of Neuromung, often poorly translated as new world order, while actually referring to the restructuring of state borders of the European map and resulting in the post-war economic hegemony of greater Germany. So one could probably say that the Nazis pursued a new world order in terms of politics, but the claim that Hitler and the Thule Society conspir conspired to create a new world order, conspiracy theory put forward on some web pages, is completely unfounded. But it's not, is it? <laughs> right? It's not. And Operation Paperclip was the United States bringing those German scientists over here and starting NASA and all of that. So, right? One can really <laughs> take that with however you want and remember this all goes back to the arcane teachings and these secret societies and we see this in modern day Hollywood and all this now Scientology and the occult right the sacred sciences and you see the eight-pointed rose cross right the hermetic order of the golden dawn Scientology um, being inspired by or sharing elements with a number of esoteric or occult systems. The founder, L. Ron Hubbard, claimed to have a near-death experience, inspired him to write Excalibur. Um, he was also involved with Jack Parsons, the American rocketry pioneer, right? NASA, Jack Propulsion's laboratory, JPL, and devoted the Lemite and the members of the Agape Lodge of Alistair Crowley's Magical Order, the OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis in Cali. Uh, Hubbard published Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, and he organized a church of Scientology. Right, and looking at Scientology here. I believe this is actually, um, what is this from? This is from a Scientology book here. The Scientology Cross. Right, see right here, it does bear the strong resemblance to the Rosicrucian cross. Right, and we see the connections to the OTO, the light of the great fire. 
which is a text. Cross, the symbol of the cross, has been widely used in symbolic traditions with many interpretations given to it. Uh, the many forms of the word cross itself, traditionally said to derive or come from a basic root word meaning light of the great fire. Distinctive Church of Scientology is symbolic because of its eight points. Eight, the spider, right? Weaving spiders, now weave here. Distinctive Cross Church of Scientology is symbolic because um, C org members devotion to the angel Church of Scientology, but commitment to the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, the greater good, right? Freemasonry and all that as well. So, um, we've already looked at looking at the Mahatma letters. Um, you know, and this leads us to the the reincarnation, all that. But Scientology, the 20th century religion, means a study of knowledge, gnosis, gnosticism, knowing about knowing. The Latin word sio, which means know or distinguish, from the word logos, which means reason itself or inward thought. So it's a study of wisdom or knowledge or knowing how to know. Scientology further defined as a study of handling of the spirit in relationship to itself universe and other life which was coined by l ron hubbard the essential tenets of scientology are these you are an immortal spiritual being you being you experience extends well beyond a single lifetime and your capabilities are limited even if not presented presently realized in scientology you are called a thetan from the greek letter theta for thought or life of the spirit, this is to avoid confusion with previous conceptions of the soul. The Thetan is the spiritual being himself. It is the individual. It is you. You are a Thetan, a spiritual being, not your eyes, not your brain, but you. You do not have a Thetan. Sometimes you keep part from yourself. You are a Thetan. Scientology provides exact principles or practical technology for improving self-confidence, intelligence, and ability. It does not require faith or belief. One can apply the principles and see for oneself if they work and are true. Scientology addresses the spirit, not simply the, the body or mind, and therefore is completely apart from the materialistic philosophies which hold that man is a product of his environment or his genes. Um, Scientology is religion by its basic tenets, practice, and historical background. And by the definition of the word religion itself, it's recognized as such by courts in country after country around the world. The highest courts, U.S., Australia, Germany. Um, all denominations are welcome in Scientology. It is a route away rather than a dissertation or an assertive body of knowledge. Uh, through its drills and studies, one may find the truth for oneself. It is the only thing that can show you who you really are. The technology is therefore not expounded as something to believe but something to do. There you go. So, you know, Scientology. Go join, right? <laughs> um, reincarnation. Uh, reality, which is consciousness simulation set in linear time to experience emotions. Within the matrix of its design, all things happen simultaneously. Hence, there is no past, present, or future, but multidimensional experiences souls have simultaneously. Experience can overlap from one grid experience to another just as flashes, information, dreams, or other out-of-body experiences. It's about your DNA programming. Focus to experience as much as you can, record the information, and share with whoever. It's all a journey, a dream, an illusion, or whatever else your mind is programmed to tell you. Remember, it comes from your thoughts, though. To view a past life regression is to see an experience your soul is having in another reality that perhaps affects the outcome of what it's doing here. As a hypnotherapist, people have past life regressions to make sense of their current life and to heal their issues and homeopathy, uh, quantum hypnosis, all of that, right? Dolores Cannon, this is all a part of the new age too. The goal of any past life regression is a unique individual person involved rather than something that is part of their collective memory and to physically verify the information given. And, you know, this is more of the same. And origin stories, um, you know, the Dogon, right, the, the dog, the Egyptians, right, we see all of this, right, it all comes from the same places too, right, and we see all these beliefs being incorporated in Freemasonry, they saw it arrive from the Sumerian gods, the gods of the sky, the Inki and Enlil, or the Anunnaki, right? The Sumerian gods. Mm. 
which also the Templars, Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki, who were the pantheon of good and evil gods and goddesses who came to the earth to the human race after the Great Flood. Uh, they used a stargate to transport back and forth, right? Mars was supposed to be a way station. Um, yeah, and wearing bird, they had bird heads, right? Feathers, feathered serpents, right? Wearing a wristwatch too. Technology. You know, creating bloodlines, biogenetic experiments. See the DNA, Kabbalah, Sumerian Tree of Life. All these depictions, you know. It all boils down to this too. And 66 books in the Bible, Jesus being 33. You know, the astro-theological story of the sun. Okay, there's aliens and extraterrestrials and watchers and all of that there too. You know, it's like, so that's the greatest Freemasonic book in the world is the Bible. You know, the Council of Nicaea, putting all of it together. Constantine, you know, this is all pagan as it gets, sun worship as it gets, stars. This is worshiping of stars. It all comes down to these Luciferian beliefs, these Luciferian principles. And it's like, um, Inky and Inlil, here's Inky. Ea, Earth, the heart, right? The heart, the feminine, Venus. Inky, Ea, stands in his watery home in the Apsu. Inky walks out of the water to the land attended by his messenger, Isamud. And remember, Jesus walks on water. You know, Israel, Isis, Ra, El, who is readily identifiable by his two faces looking in opposite directions, duality, good and evil, masculine and feminine. Inky, who stands with the gods and the initiate. Water of life flowing in the laboratory glassware indicates alchemical circulation, creation of the first human. Right, you look at the lost book of Inky, we were a genetic experiment in that. A laboratory, the bloodline, the tree of life. You know, the kings and, you know, of uh, Egypt and all that, and the bloodlines, kings and queens, hang, uh, hanging of the water, liquid, blood of life, biogenetically engineered human. It's the humans could be hybrid species, duality, yin yang, male female, twin soul aspects, two brothers. Inky's emblem was two serpents, twin DNA, entwined on a staff on the basis of the winged caduceus symbol used by modern Western medicine as a rod of Hermes. Inky's sacred number is 40, 40 days in the desert, 40 years in the desert, right? He was the leader of the first sons of Anu who came down to earth, playing a pivotal role in saving humanity from the deluge. He defiled the Anunnaki ruling council and told Zayasudra, Sumerian Noah, how to build a ship and save humanity from the blood. He would have been over 120 years old at that time, and yet his activity with humanity continued to be actively reported for thousands of years after. Inky's youngest son, Ningazira, and his oldest son, Marduk, right, uh, Mars, Ra, uh, was the lord of the tree of truth. In Mesopotamia, he played the role of Toth. In Egypt, the ancient mystery school teachings of Toth were passed down to his initiates who became the priest. They hid the secret knowledge of creation, passing it down through the ages until the experiment was to end. Enki was a deity of water, intelligence, and creation. The main temple of Enki was the so-called Zen Yingur Ra, the house of the water deep in Eridu which was the wetlands of the Euphrates Valley at some distance of the Persian Gulf. This takes us to the cradle of civilization. We look at Atlantis, right? Um, and the stories, you know, surrounding that and water and Poseidon, you know, the, the mermaids and the children of the water, right? Ea, the lord of the water, the lord of the earth, right? It kind of takes you to all of this and the lord commander Enlil, right? Who destroyed uh, humanity. And then what was it destroyed with? Water, a flood, you know? And see the connections to Toth and Hermes and then Caduceus, right? And Lucifer and Venus and Jupiter and the planets. And it goes on and on and on. Showing you one after another that no religion is different from each other. No matter how you chop it up. 
Even Christianity is just an exoteric, an externalizing, right? An outside deity. God is in the sky, right? The sky of Father, Jupiter, right? Um, Jesus, Jesus, right? Zeus, right? Thor, um, who is the firstborn son of God, the son of God, Christ, who bore our stripes, the striped planet, right? And who's the father? Saturn, Satan, okay? Right? The accuser, the adversary, the Lord commander in the who destroyed humanity, right? Who is the one, you know, kind of um, stepping up for humanity, right? The, the, the teacher, light, knowledge, good, evil, right? The Messiah. So, finally, we finish this off with asking that question. Is this a mass global awakening? Right? Spiritual awakening into this conscious awareness that we're having. Is it natural? Right? And the vibration of the planet rising through the New Age movement. Right? And all these cool different ideas when it comes to the sacred sciences and alchemy and astrology and divination and all of it. Or is it straight darkness and evil being perpetrated by the enemy of humanity? The serpent, the dragon, the snake, right? Lucifer, Satan, right? And are we being mass indoctrinated, initiated into these mysteries, right? Essentially cursing humanity, marking humanity for destruction. You know, into serpent knowledge we shouldn't know corrupting us, you know, brainwashing us, and we see it through the television and everything today, you know, the satanic symbolism and all of that, right? And it's the Illuminati, this secret society, right, of these arcane truths and mysteries, this hidden hand, nudging and guiding humanity to this one world religion, this one world system, this one world order. I uh, will leave that answer to you you know what you feel is going on what you feel it means to you it's all on your perspective and your perception so um, make sure you use your critical discernment and your critical thinking your spiritual discernment when it comes to these as always and I hope you guys enjoyed today's show today's video um, and thank you guys so much for watching make sure to check out my tarot videos um, make sure to check out my astrology videos guys Give the thumbs up, comment like crazy, um, share the links that way new people can find me. I'm going to continue to drop knowledge and, you know, videos like this. You know, you guys have been asking a lot, like, I miss your old videos, I miss your longer shows. So I'm going to bring a lot more of these at least every week. Um, I also have an interview with Micah Dank. I'm going to be posting that in the next day or so as well. Astrotheologist and author. Um, yeah, check out all the new readings and all that. Book your own personal tarot reading. Uh, 50 bucks really cheap really inexpensive they're great fucking uh birthday gifts you know wedding gifts all that and they're just fun to do and it's nice to check in on that you know every so often anyways um i can get you in within 24 hours text 513-393-2396 or email the real best damn podcast at gmail.com please 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 donate support to the channel we're viewer power that's how i keep it going PayPal, Venmo, Patreon, Cash App, or Facebook Messenger Pay. Or you can join us, YouTube channel memberships, uh, Facebook fan subscriptions, Patreon, um, or join the Best Game Fam, 33 bucks a month, access to our private and live shows. You know, all our cool conspiracy stuff is all uploaded to a Dropbox. I'll text you that link or send you that link, or you can join on one of those and get access to that as well. Um, and yeah, make sure to subscribe. Click the bell to get the notifications. Hit the like, leave a comment, donate, support, and share this and get it out there. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. God bless you all. I love you, and I will see you next time. Peace.